Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, we love you. We adore you. We extol you. We thank you for the enabling at this moment to do what you call us to do. You always do that. You always come through. And I give you thanks and I give you praise and I give you worship. I repent of sin and I renounce Satan. I give you my life. I thank you for all you're doing and all you're going to do. Come thou fountain of every blessing, tune our hearts to sing your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, today is the 26th of April, 2021. And the sun is about to set. And as the sun sets here in a few minutes, it's already set in different places in the world. Then um, in Jewish reckoning, you know, the next day starts when the sun sets. And this is not why I am here. This is not, I want to mention this. Somehow I think it is probably relevant. Uh, probably most of you don't know. It's in, uh, I think it's in Numbers chapter 9. But believe it or not, this is the awesomeness of the grace of God. Here I go. It, it, it says in, in Numbers, and I meant to look this up, but this is not even where I was going to go at all, at all. So I'm just going to tell you this. But starting at sunset is the 14th day of the second month, which is second Passover. And second Passover is about, you know, theoretically, you know, it's got a prophetic picture. But the way it worked back then was if you were on a journey or you were unclean through no fault of your own. There's a lot of, most of the reasons you could be, you would be unclean, but it'd be something that wasn't had anything to do with sin. Like, you know, somebody died in your presence, and, you know, somebody's got to attend the dying, then you're unclean for 24 hours or something like that, and you can't do Passover. Or if you have all kinds of situations, can make you unclean. And so you can't take Passover. Or if you're out of town, say Passover was, was taken in Jerusalem. But if you're out of town and you couldn't take it, there was an allowance because you were supposed to be cut off from the people if you didn't take Passover. The blood had to be applied annually. But, the you know, the Passover was on the 14th day of the first month, okay? It's supposed to be. But if you missed it to no fault of your own, there was the 14th day of the second month, and the Lord allowed a second chance, a second Passover. And to me, that is a picture of there are a lot of people who did not have the opportunity to take, to receive the Lord in the same way that I did. They didn't have the opportunity. And he makes a way for those who are away on a journey, unclean through no fault of their own. And it's a picture of God's grace, God's mercy at a belated time. Anyway, it starts here in a few hours, a couple hours, one hour, two hours. Also, tomorrow is the 10th anniversary of the, The tornadoes, 66 tornadoes coming across Alabama and killing 280 people. The most tornadoes in one day in one state ever. And that is very much what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we're going to read three scriptures. So you're going to see some scriptures. But unapologetically, uh, this is going to be a, a prophetic seminar applied the applied prophetic and how what it looks like what the lord can call a person to do how real it is how significant this is and um so we're going to we're going to hit three scriptures in the process of this 
But I got to tell you a story. I want to begin with Matthew 22. Here at Bible in a Bar. And Jesus is replying here in verse 29 to the Sadducees who, have, who do not believe in afterlife, resurrection, angels, spirits. They don't believe in much. Um, they don't know the scriptures or the power of God, Jesus says here. Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Okay. And then he gives an example of the scriptures that testify of the afterlife. He quotes Exodus chapter three, I believe it is. And it is Exodus three. And so later on, I think within the very, this week, he's going to give them the power of God proof of the resurrection because he's going to rise from the dead never to die again. So it's really important that we know the scriptures and the power of God. We know the scriptures and what the Lord is saying now. What he is, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that is proceeding from the mouth of God. Proceeding is, is the verb there. In other words, my sheep hear my voice, not just shepherds, but the sheep, the normal Christian life is to hear the voice of God. And, you know, really, I had no idea when I got up this morning that I was going to be teaching this. But as I prayed, I felt like the Lord told me to do this. So there's hopefully that's an accurate example. It's not going to be something dramatically provable but maybe it will bear witness as we go along. Okay, a um, little background. I'm going to talk about 2011. I'm talking about 10 years ago this month, 10 years ago last month, 10 years ago, two months ago. I'm going to talk about 2011 and something that came to be known as the Four Horsemen of Alabama, an intercessory horseback prayer ride. I'm um, going to talk about that. Before I tell, start talking about that, which was, it was a pretty physical kind of a prayer meeting. Um, I want you to know the context because there's some stuff that, that happened that seems like it's ancillary and doesn't really apply, but I'm going to go into this because I want a record of this. I'm very thankful to get this recorded. But in 2010, uh, without going into it too much, because of my own shortcomings, I wound up in the hospital. Uh, I wound up the sickest I'd ever been and flat on my back for a while, I don't know, a week. And I came home and I was literally on a walker for a month, maybe a little more. Uh, I'd had a horse wreck was part of it and hit my knee, but there was this huge hematoma in my lower left leg, a big hematoma, and it was extremely painful, but it was a, involved something else. It wasn't just a mistake. It was transgression in my part. That's another story. But it makes a fellow feel at age 58 at that point in time. January, February, 2010, makes a fellow feel pretty frail who had been out, you know, I've been used to going out and being very physical. Cattle rancher, tough guy. All of a sudden, I was, but I had to press on. I actually built fences on a walker uh, with, you know, one leg up. It was hurting. Anyway, felt pretty frail my leg got gradually better, but who I, it would have been beyond my wildest dreams during those times that in February of 2011, 
the Lord would call me to get on a horse and ride 222 miles from Tennessee to Montgomery. Pretty awesome thing for a, you know, a wannabe cowboy and a wannabe boy. I mean, I'm still a boy at heart, like most guys are still a boy at heart. You know, <clears throat> yeehaw. Not only would he call me to do that, but he'd make me able to do it, and that was a miracle. That was close to a resurrection. That was major. And in the process of that, and I'll get to that, I saw the most amazing physical healing in my body, and it wasn't really about my lower leg. It was about something else that I've ever seen. I got a genuine bona fide physical healing. So in, uh, I'm gonna try not to call any names. I'm gonna call this particular lady, Betty. <laughs> That's not her name. <clears throat> but I've been told about this Betty lady who did prayer rides across the country, across the United States, across different states, different areas, this region. Uh, I always presume, you know, prophetic people, especially women, are kind of flaky. Really, I do. <laughs> I'm wrong many times. I'm right a few times. But uh, anyway, I, I had met this person, and but I was encouraged by a couple of people that I, I uh, am in submission to. You need to connect with this lady. So I got, you know, back then I was doing email, and she said, hey, look, I'm coming from Ohio. They're about Valentine's Day. She and her lady friend, call her Laura. That's not her name either. But Betty and Laura were coming south through Alabama, and they were going to be going to Florida with pulling a trailer with a couple of white horses. And they wanted to know if they could stop by. Well, it was kind of a hassle directing them in. I didn't have a GPS, and they missed it. And I just encouraged them. They got south of me. Yeah, I just keep going, just keep going. You know, you don't want to turn around and come, but she did. Thank God. So she and Laura came and we unloaded their two horses in our pasture. So we walk in and this, uh, you know, kind of sizing each other up. She sits down in our living room and um, pretty quiet kind of a lady. She's not a yakety yakety person, but she, uh, was sitting there on the couch facing my north wall in my living room and on my north wall for 25, 26 years now, this map has been hanging there. And this map of Alabama, it's a major part of our lives. We've, every day, we're about Alabama, every day. Um, no wonder they're winning all those football games. Right, right. Anyhow, uh, she looked at that and she sat there. I remember she sat there, legs crossed, kind of hands between her legs. She says, the Lord's saying to me for us to put four teams of horsemen at the four corners of the state. We need to do it on, we need to start riding on Passover. And everybody needs to ride and meet in Montgomery for the National Day of Prayer, which is on 5-5. Passover, that is Easter, was on 419 that year. And she said, we need to do that. And I'm going, wow, that's interesting. I want to kind of keep up with you, hear how this comes out. Sounds interesting. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to hold this thing arm's length best I can. But they, she and Laura spent the night and next morning, I believe it was 9.30. I know where I was standing. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're going to be in submission to her overall leadership for this thing, but you're going to be responsible for doing the two northern rides. She'll cover the two southern rides. <clears throat> She's got a vision for that. But you're going to get together two teams of horsemen, and you're going to lead one. You're going to lead this northeast leg. He, he spoke that to me. And he said that, and I'm, I mean, was, I can tell you the spot I was standing. Well, about 45 minutes, 45 minutes later, 
Jerry Wayne Johnson. Yeah, I called his name. We buried him a couple of weeks ago, so I don't care for calling his name. Give him all the credit I can. The strongest prophetic guy I've ever known. He sends me a text, and he says, Miles, I see you getting on your horse. Looks like the ride is on. You got on all your Western gear. He said, your horse is a is an octagon rice crispy. Well, I had lost my horse of a lifetime a couple of years before. And all I had was this Palomino mare that I had kind of inherited from my oldest daughter, whose name is Daisy. <coughs> I believe we can put her name on internet. And Daisy is known to be skittish. And I knew that the Bryce Crispy horse was the fact that she was snap, crackle, and pop. I mean, and the Lord's telling me to get on that horse and ride on the side of the highway beside trailer trucks for 200 miles. Right. Okay. He always pours water on the altar before the fire fall. But the octagon, what was that about? Well, in, in the next 24 hours, I wound up in a prayer meeting with a, holding a guy's staff in my hand as I was praying, and it was octagon. He had it, it was machined into an octagon, and then he showed me his prayer drum, the same guy, and it had a Psalm 24 written on it, and he was worshiping the Lord with this prayer drum, and it was octagon. It had it handmade, and the Holy Spirit said, your horse is going to become an object or an instrument of worship and warfare. Octagon Rice Krispie. You look, if you're not willing to, to, to be insulted by, by the Lord saying something that sounds stupid to you that you'll never forget, figure out, then he's just not going to speak to you like that. That's the price. That's the cost. You got to be willing to be humbled and hopeless. And you don't, you don't know what he's saying, but you ain't going to quit because it sounds silly. Anyway, that's part of the price of the prophetic anyway so i knew this was this is the real deal and this is going to happen <clears throat> and so uh betty and laura proceeded on down to uh florida they had a ride scheduled down there and she she left me there with the holy spirit and um that my own issues and so i uh my first issue was and this and you know i was over the thing with my calf of my leg being swelled and stuff but for about 10 years i had had both knees swelled and sore i could not get down even on soft ground on my knees without great pain and if I did anything like that, they swelled worse. Both of them did. I had a real knee problem. And so uh, when you get on a horse and you're riding, you know, you, when you get past a walk, you, you're kind of standing and the pressure's on your legs and you're doing this, you know, your legs are doing this and it's a lot of pressure on your knees. And I said, help me Jesus. And so, I wasn't even used to really this mare that I'd inherited. And so I called my second daughter to come over and ride with me. And she did <clears throat> so I can kind of keep a handle on this mare. And I get on her back and, and my knees are hurting so bad. We have to walk the horse. I can't even trot because it hurts my knees so bad. She came back a few days later and got on the horse and my knees were amazingly, they were a lot better. They still hurt but I could trot a little bit, lope a little bit, go back to a walk. And it was amazingly better. The third time I got on that horse, so this is before the prayer ride. This is just riding around on the ranch. My knees were completely healed and they have never given me a problem in the 10 years since. They're no longer any swelling, zero, none, zip. Can you hardly remember back when they swelled and hurt? He healed my knees to make it possible. You know, all I know is get yourself in a situation where God's got to heal you and he will, <laughs> I reckon. But uh, some other things here I wanted to mention. 
uh, Betty mentioned when, when she first said this about this ride, uh, she let me name it. I named it the Four Horsemen of Alabama, okay, as in the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And, but she said, the power will go off when we do this. It, there will be a, a lot of spiritual warfare, and the power will go off when we do this. Just get ready for that. Um, right from the outset. Um, I have a friend I'll call uh, Tim. This is not his name. And it seems like very often he's very, he dreams very frequently. And a lot of times the Lord puts us in sync. I called Tim and told him what the Lord had spoke to me. And he says, that's strange. He said, I dreamed last night about a young horse it was a goody colored. He's a science guy. This guy's a science guy. So he uses the term a goody. A goody is the color of a, of a deer, a white-tailed deer or a rabbit. That mixture of brown and a little bit of black. It's a very natural color. It was a goody color, young horse. And he said it was very gentle. It was very tame. And he said, but it had a little weakness in its right rear leg. And um, so I called Betty and told her about this. And our understanding was, you know, goody represents natural. That's the, kind of the natural color of an animal. That, that this was a God thing. God made this color. The ride is, the horse was relatively tame for a young horse. But if, you, if you're facing like this, okay, the right rear leg is this corner of the state down here. The uh, southeast leg was going to be the weakest and that would be the one we'd have to start, start praying for. And so we had a lot of people praying in particular for the leaders and the people doing this leg down here that there might be some issues. And there was, uh, we it got it done, but it only with uh, the grace of God. So he was on, on this thing with us there from the beginning. Um, about then February the 28th, again, the, the, she heard that about the ride on the uh, Valentine's Day. I heard on the 15th. About the 28th, Barbara saw a vision. Uh, Bobby saw a vision. <laughs> uh, Billy saw a vision. Of um, Saw a vision of the number 150. And we didn't know what that was about. Really, it's kind of presuming at that point in time that it was about Psalm 150. And yes, I believe it was that too, about praise. This was about, it wasn't so much about just, oh God, please, oh God, please break these curses. But it was about praise and, and the power of praise. So, uh, but it turned out this ride, as it was going to start on, as it was going to start on Passover 419 of twenty. 11 it was falling smack on within a very few days the 150th anniversary of the civil war and we knew this was about breaking curses that had to do with racism and division and all that goes with you know that civil war thing this arrogance and uh you know we were praying into that we also knew that there would be blowback um that there would be a cost for this because these long set principalities that have been there for a long time are not unseated easily. And um, so uh, realizing that this was about breaking the curse of the civil war and racism, uh, I ordered this and this is, you know, every little boy wants an excuse to order one of these, but, this is a sword. This is actually a union, um, a union saber. And I ordered this as, as a picture of unity. And here's this good old Southern boy riding across Alabama with a union sword, but it was about unity and love and breaking the curse of the civil war and the racism. So that was on my saddle all the way down. Um, 
all the way down to Montgomery. This was hanging on my other, I had this for many years at that point in time. Uh, this is my shofar. Uh, got this, this is actually an old rain off of a bridle. And I, I still am amazed that this thing stays on there and don't slide off. It's been on there ever since. I don't even know why it stays on there, but it's, <laughs> it stays on there. It's not riveted or anything. Um, hanging on my right side of my saddle. Um, it's, that's once in a while my horse would shake or something like that and it would fall off and that's how it kind of got busted up on the end. But, um, I blow the show, but it did a lot of blowing the show far up and down the road. And I set into finding everybody I could to ride with me. Actually, a lot of people said they would and they was going to show up. So I'm said to have become with wagons, but you no, know, no bitterness or anything, but nobody really showed when it came time to actually do this thing they had other things to do um i had my horse and i had another horse there the family and so for the first five days when we did get started um i provided a, a I had a, a companion riding with me several different people rode with me about seven or eight we'd ride for a day or a half a day mostly half a day on that other horse and but to the sixth day by the sixth day i was riding by myself but uh something else um i wanted to mention in the context of preparing to talk about this um on there were these particular particular dates that some stuff happened and and i may be stumbling a lot but if, if this is a lot for you just replay the tape or whatever, but I want this recorded. On March the 14th, again, we're gonna do the, we did the ride on April the 19th, but on March the 14th, which is Pi Day, <clears throat> 2011, uh, Betty came back, had come back up from, uh, from uh, Montgomery, and uh, we had a group we called the A-Team. It was eight of us guys that would meet together. The Lord would give us projects to do each, each, uh, each guy had a different gift. And so when I announced to this, this group, you know, early on about what was up, they were all excited about it. So we, the A team met with Betty in a, a building, yeah, warehouse building with a glass wall facing west there in Birmingham. And she's there and I go down there and uh, she's real quiet. But bang, <clears throat> right across the road, Alabama Power, a uh, <clears throat> transformer exploded loudly, fire, flames, smoke, and the power kind of quivered for a few minutes. Then a few, and 10 minutes later, it happened again across the road. After a while, it happened again. Finally, after about 30 minutes, the fourth one blew up and the knocked the power out in that region of the city. We were preparing to fix a, a big meal there in this dwelling warehouse place, but we had to go to a restaurant across town and um, and eat, but the power went off and it was about the number four again, four transformers, four horsemen of Alabama, a forewarning. Um, that happened and um, and I, I debated on whether or not to include this piece of information because I'm gonna be sharing so much tonight. But as, as crazy as this sounds, it's okay. It has to be okay to say crazy stuff if you want God to talk to you. And this really does, I mean, even my most prophetic friends think I've got a screw loose on this. Well, not all of them, but some of them do. And, you know, maybe I do, but I'm going to say this because I believe God told me this. On the way down to meet with this group on Pi Day, uh, I was passing, going down Highway 79. And um, it's like, I, you know how you get kind of sleepy driving. And in that, sometimes when God seems to speak to me the best, a lot of times is when I'm asleep or nearly asleep. And it's like I could see almost a vision in front of me of a two-digit number. 
and, and there was a black arrow pointing at it, and then there was a black arrow pointing away, and the Holy Spirit said, there are some people who are going to get to a certain age, and then they're going to, it'll be their turning point, and they're going to de-age. Okay, I know that sounds crazy, but that's what I heard. I was coming through Locust Fork, came around the corner, and right there at mile marker 27.3 was uh, a sign for a Methodist church. And the name of the church was The Turning Point, and it had a black arrow on the sign, I promise. <clears throat> I think they've changed the church sign since then. But anyway, that seemed strange to me, but I went on with a meeting power went out and then about that time jerry wayne johnson and tim the guy that had the uh dream about the uh, horse with a weak right leg both of them had dreams or visions <coughs> about tornadoes coming out of the gulf of mexico coming up across the state Jerry specifically saw these tornadoes slash bulls. They were like bulls. And these bulls were pulling meat hooks, whatever that means. But our understanding was that the, the threat was of, for death. That there was a death spirit, a human mortality. And we knew that we were into a war when we did this thing, that something was going to be stirred up. Now, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, uh, tomorrow is the 10th anniversary of that moment during the prayer ride, in the middle of the prayer ride, when 280 people were killed in the state. Okay, you may say, well, if that's the cost of, of doing this kind of thing, why do it? Well, if you think about it, that's uh, exactly what the Israelites said in Exodus chapter 5. Uh, Moses says, um, Moses says, let my people go, Pharaoh. Let my people go. And they've been in, in this slavery for a long time, for many years. And, but they had a, a relatively modest kind of slavery in that they had their own livestock. We know that for sure. But they were having to work for Pharaoh, but he provided them with straw to make the bricks. And they were building the pyramids or whatever. But when Moses said, began their deliverance, and Moses said, let my people go, Pharaoh said, verse 17, chapter 5, verse 17, Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That's why you keep saying, let us go to sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to the work. And you will not be given any straw, yet you must produce the full quota of bricks. The Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told, you're not to reduce the number of bricks required for you each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Uh, in other words, Moses and Aaron wasn't popular with anybody when they first said, let my people go. And things didn't get better. They got worse. But, of course, now we know the rest of the story. And that this war, when you go to war in the spirit, that things don't, don't necessarily immediately get better. They may immediately get worse. Look with me also over to 1 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, Israel at this, at this juncture has been really backslid. Uh, they're really just coming out of the period of the judges where they were really pretty bad. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant has been captured and then recovered. And then in chapter 7, verse 2, 
It was a long time, 20 years in all, that the ark remained at kiriath Jerem. And all the people of Israel mourned and sought after the Lord. And Samuel said to the whole house of Israel, If you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and asterisks and commit yourselves to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the Israelites put away their Baals and asterisks and served the Lord only. And then they have an assembly, and they repent, and they pour out water in a symbolic picture of pouring out their hearts before the Lord. And they cry out to God. And when they do, guess what happens? The Philistines hear about it. And they show up with swords in hand, ready to go to attack this prayer meeting. In other words, when the, the deliverance began through Samuel, things didn't get better. They got worse. Now, God rescued them, and they had a great victory there that day over the Philistines. But there was a battle, and the battle was caused by the repentance, by the people repenting. In other words, the enemy, if you actually have a revival in your life, the enemy is not necessarily going to encourage you in that direction. If you're going to quit because things get worse when you try to move to God, then guess what? You're going to quit. That's just the name of the game. So Jerry and this brother, whose name is not Tim, saw these two dreams. I don't have the dates on theirs, but specifically, I had two dreams after that. Uh, and my dreams were about the same subject. First one was March 28th, 2011. Uh, I dreamed sick. I, I was saw, I was in Coleman. Can't, Coleman's a city in Alabama. I was in Coleman and I saw six tornadoes coming and they were coming out straight for me. And I was in a cemetery and there was a block retaining wall around the cemetery. And as they came toward me, I kind of got out on my knees and ducked down. And the tornadoes were so strong, they knocked over the retaining wall blocks kind of over on my back with some loose dirt. It didn't hurt me. It's just kind of like, didn't hurt me at all. And I stood up after they passed over and looked up in the sky. And there was in the sky a sun dog. A sun dog is a shaft of rainbow that's just straight. It's not like a, you know, a regular rainbow, but it's colored like that. But it's, it's a meteorological phenomenon that happens occasionally you may have seen it before but there was this big sun dog in the sky and i took it to well the lord told me he said the tornadoes are coming to coleman i did not know they were coming to the whole state although i might have inferred that from tim and jerry's dreams but he showed me they were coming to coleman I believe it's because I was born in Coleman, and that gives me some kind of a latent authority there. I live not in Coleman. I live about an hour and 15 minutes from Coleman now. I live in a different county entirely. But these, the Lord said to me, the structures will come down. There's a lot of death, spiritual death in this town. Okay? It wasn't a graveyard. <clears throat> the structures will come down. <clears throat> but if you'll get someone to pray in Coleman, you can stop the spirit of death from killing anybody. So that was on March the 28th. On April the 11th, I had a second dream about Coleman. And in the dream, I actually saw a nuclear bomb. And it had, <clears throat> you've seen these wind up toys where you pull out a chain and it goes, and then the chain gets pulled back in and goes like a timer. Well, and this, this bomb, I took hold of the chain and pulled the chain out as far as I could. And when I turned it loose, it was started ticking. And the Lord told me this tornado is going to be so severe. They're going to say, it looks like a nuclear bomb went off. It's going to change the superstructure in Coleman. Uh, you have bought some time, but when the time runs out, the structures are going to come down. But if you'll get somebody to pray in Coleman, there'll be no death. So I called a brother, 
called him Terry. It's not his name, but he pastored there in Coleman. I asked Terry to pray. The tornadoes are coming to Coleman soon. If y'all will pray, though, God will stop the spirit of death. I, I, don't, I don't know if you believe this stuff or not. I don't care a whole lot. But <clears throat> why is the South called Tornado Alley? Why, is, why are there so many tornadoes in Kansas, Oklahoma? I don't think that it is entirely just a meteorological scientific phenomenon. Winds, tornadoes move so easily by such small pressures. They say that a hurricane, a category five hurricane begins with <clears throat> the smallest puff of wind, like maybe even from a <clears throat> the beat of a, of a butterfly wing. God's got control of all these things. <clears throat> and if he's sovereign, especially as it pertains to things like with life and death, there are issues here. And I believe that in the South, we are reaping the whirlwind. We've sowed the wind, we're reaping the whirlwind. This is about that. The tornadoes are gonna come. He was going to give us, he was gonna let, kind of like when you put a fleece down and everything's wet around it, but the fleece is dry. In other words, it, with this intercession of prophetic, apostolic coordination, then this Coleman thing will be an example to you. It'll be flattened, but nobody will die. And all around will be death, unfortunately. Okay, now, <clears throat> this seems a little incoherent because I'm talking about rejuvenation and I'm talking about this prayer ride at the same time, but I wanna record these. And I believe, I believe that you know, a year before I had been like an invalid. I had been on a walker for a long time. I was in great pain. I was a long way from able. I mean, I couldn't even get on my tractor to feed my cows round bales of hay. I had to have a friend come and feed my cows for me. I couldn't pull up on the tractor. My leg hurt so bad. I just couldn't do it. And I'm gonna go for that in one year's time to jumping on a horse and riding 222 miles down highways in the spring of the year and not get killed, not even get dumped. I mean, I didn't hit the ground one time. And by the way, I rode that all that time, all that distance. I got rained on 30 minutes. And then that's pretty, that's pretty good in Alabama for April and May. Anyway, so during that time, um, okay, like I said, the second dream there about Coleman was April the 11th, but somewhere around March the 28th, somebody said something about Superman a while ago. Let's see, oh, that's the next one. But somewhere around March the 28th, I, I went to bed at one o'clock in the morning and my Wife and daughters have fussed on me, says, Daddy, you don't need to stay up that late. That's not good for you. And I got in bed and I was exhausted. And it's mostly my fault. I just got a bad habit of doing that, staying up late. So I go to bed and, I, and I'm thinking, I didn't say a word, but I'm thinking, Miles, you don't need to do this. You're getting too old to go to bed at one o'clock in the morning. And my wife, who was asleep, she woke up and said, not. <laughs> I said, what? She said, I heard the Lord say, not. <laughs> and what he was saying was, don't even think it. Don't confess it that you're getting too old to stay up to one o'clock in the morning. But not only that, don't even think it. Not. <laughs> that happened. She didn't know what it was. She just heard the Lord. She just blurted it out. Not so well, that's crazy. Well, a couple of days later, on March the 30th, 2011, I dreamed that I was Superman in my Clark Kent. I had on the Clark Kent, had on the Superman suit underneath the Clark Kent suit, and I was sitting there oh, in a 
room full of people on uh, folding chairs, metal folding chairs. And we were all listening to this guy speak. And I remember, Lois Lane was sitting right beside me. And nobody there knows I'm Superman, right? I'm just, I, I got on my Clark Kent outfit. But we're listening to this guy talk, and he's a shaman. He's a witch. And he says, okay, everybody in the room, listen to me. And now you, I'm hypnotizing you. Fall asleep. So everybody in the room, sitting there in their chair, dropped their head down like this and went to sleep. Well, he didn't really do that to me, but I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I got to play along with this so they'll know I'm Superman. So I dropped my head down too. Everybody else is asleep. And then the shaman said, okay, everybody, turn to dust. And everybody in the room turned to little piles of dust sitting in their little folding chair, including Lois Lane right beside me. So everybody turned to dust. And I looked, I looked up, looked around, looked at him, and I says, listen, Buster, I'm Superman. Turn them back or I'm going to kick your fanny. And see, what I had done when the Lord had, on that first words, some people are going to get to a certain point and they're going to get younger. I said, okay, Lord, I believe that, but you didn't say it was me. Well, then I had the, uh, the experience about not, and the Lord was saying, okay, yeah, this is about you. Don't even be saying this about yourself. And then I said, okay, well, is this for anybody else? Can I pray this for somebody else? Am I responsible for anybody else? Well, in that dream, it was like I was responsible for interceding for other people that are turning to dust. Turn them back. Okay, so that was the third of the three experiences. So, also, I'm going to, again, this is a lot, and this is going to be a little jumbled, a little bit incoherent. But this happened. It is from God. If I can go through the stuff of getting this, you can go through the stuff of trying to sort this out. But on April the 3rd, the Lord almost always gives me something neat on my birthday. And on April the 3rd of that year, um, I got up and Jerry Johnson had sent me a, he sent me an email and he said, Take this seriously, Miles. The Lord says, take this seriously. He says, happy reverse birthday. And I said, wow, wow, wow. Happy reverse birthday. Okay. I was expecting to, you know, look the next morning and my hair would be back. It wasn't. But anyway, I started expecting that. Um, and bef on, on that day, my daughters uh, came over and their husbands and little ones came over for my birthday to celebrate my birthday and it's April 3rd, 2011. And one of my daughters says, Hey, look, I bought this movie for us to watch. It's called Bicentennial Man. It stars Robin Williams, you know, ever forever for 20 or 30 years, people have always told me I look like Robin Williams. It's got more intense with the Teddy Roosevelt movie came out with him then not at the museum, but, He's a robot in this particular movie. And so we're sitting there watching it, and I can just really feel the Holy Spirit is on this. I'm going, okay, God, you got something up your sleeve. It's my birthday. You're going to surprise me again. Yeah, I know. So I watch this character. He's a robot, but he gradually, they, they change his parts out, and he becomes more and more almost human, almost human, almost human. And then, and this is poignant because it um, means a lot more than maybe I can go into tonight. But he starts really kind of grieving for the fact that everybody else around him is aging and he's not. And so people he loves are all dying off. And so he gets up to his bicentennial man is the name of the movie. And he gets up to around 200 years old and he says, I want you to modify me so that I'll age. So he finally ages and he dies and they have his funeral and they announce his birthday of the robot the day he was turned on, I reckon. And guess what? It's April 3rd. So I'm sitting there going, oh, okay. I don't know what all this is about. But in the middle of, okay, this is what I believe, that the Lord is tickled that a guy that's 58 years old that had been crippled a year before and his knees was bad, and then the Lord is telling him to get on a spooky, jumpy horse and ride 200 miles and make it happen. 
and promise not to come home no matter what happens during the ride. And he's pleased with that. And in the middle of that, he's splicing in these words, five words, about rejuvenation. Now, okay, if my funeral is before I expect it to be, play this tape at my funeral and y'all just get a big hee-haw laugh. It's fine with me. But if it's when I think it's going to be, then maybe it won't be so funny. Okay. All right. So on April the 18th of 2011, all the four corners of the horsemen rides, they, we met at the four different corners. Each group met at the corner and we took communion. It was Passover. It was Easter. We celebrated the Lord in every way. <clears throat> and the next morning, we got, we, we, it was awesome. We were up here at Scottsboro at the <clears throat> Scottsboro Boys Museum. Had 35 folks show up, had a big spread of food, had a big feast. And uh, it was awesome. And so the next morning, we got up to start the ride. And I went up with my two horses and uh, my wife and about six or eight or 10 other people that were there in different cars with us to follow us up there to pray for us as we started the ride. And up there where 72 Highway crosses into Tennessee, there's a gas station on the left that is on the west side of the road called Big Daddy's. And, uh, you know, God the Father is Big Daddy. So anyway, so we filled, filled up the fuel right there that morning real early, had the two horses on the trailer, had the, uh, my, and my daughter and I, my second daughter and I were in the truck and we were getting ready to pull out. And I looked over and there was a gentleman sitting over there at a picnic table, concrete picnic table. And he had gray hair down to here and a beard down to here. And it was kind of woven, braided. His beard was braided, not the whole thing, but some of it. And he was sitting at that picnic table and he had a Harley Davidson sitting there. And I said, honey, hold on a minute. I'll be right back. I think that's an angel. So I went over and I said, good morning, sir. And he said, hello. I said, what's your name? He said, Michael. And I said, hmm. He says, I don't know why I'm here. The Lord told me to come here and stay here till further notice. And he had his Bible open on that picnic table. It was Michael with a drawn sword. Okay. It was a picture of an angel somehow. Whether he was actually a material person, I don't know. I didn't touch him. I didn't punch him. I didn't get a blood sample. But he looked like a natural person, but he looked strange. Sitting there early in the morning at a picnic table at a gas station reading his Bible. Anyway, I think we had a lot of protection. I kept running into Michaels on the trip that represented, I think, uh, the fact that the Lord was encouraging me to know that we were being protected and we were being protected by this dangerous thing in order to stop some danger, partly. So uh, the ride began. I began to ride 22 miles a day coming south. The other, I was coming from right here, headed from Montgomery. There was another group that started from here, heading to Montgomery. Simultaneously, the two southwest, southeastern legs, they started headed for Montgomery. And we began to ride. And <clears throat> I had planned, my wife and I had ridden, we'd had this two months to prepare. So we had ridden from the northeast leg, from the northeast point all the way to Montgomery, a time or two to plot out what the trip, were, where we should ride. So we would be on a highway with plenty of shoulder. So we wouldn't be getting killed, you know what I mean? And we had a truck. I had my own truck uh, there pulling the trailer, and there's a big old diesel, F-250, long wheelbase, uh, and I had always had somebody driving the truck. We began with my one of my daughters driving the truck, but another one of my daughters riding the other horse. The first day, she rode the whole day, and uh, that other daughter was driving, drove two or three days along that time period. Let's see here. Um, 
But what was interesting, you know, if, if you know, if you want, again, you want God to do something super supernatural, well, get ready to do something super for him. And he does amazing things. But as we started out the ride, I told that driver and all the other people who drove for me at different times, don't touch this odometer. I want to zero this odometer. And because uh, I want to know what it's going to, what is going, the odometer is going to be on when we get done in Montgomery. And so they always said, okay, 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 we won't touch it. Well, the funny thing, see, I, I believe that God had total control of every inch of this whole thing, even though my odometer only worked when you got up, up to 30 miles an hour. My speedometer and odometer, neither one would work till you got up to about 30 miles an hour and it would, it would kick in and it would start turning. So that's chaos, right? And also, you know, we would, I would ride the horse to a certain point and we'd load the horse up and go to a home or a hotel or someplace wherever it was provided for to stay. And we would ride around and we'd go back to that point and start again. So we were zigzagging all over the country, but I thought God can handle two levels of chaos, an odometer that don't work right and zigzagging all over the country. Now, let me tell you this jumping ahead to tell you this. When I got down three days before it was over, we was down almost to Montgomery, below Birmingham. My, I told all these, my rider says, oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot, and I zeroed the odometer. And I said, well, shucks, you know what I mean? I'm, what I was really saying was, God couldn't handle three levels of chaos. Could he? He could only handle two. You know, the fact that my odometer didn't work right, we were zigzagging all over the country. That brother was a good brother. He says, I'm so sorry. Well, guess what? When we pulled, there's a parking lot down there in Montgomery, right there by the Capitol, where we all, all of us parked right there and unloaded our horses. So we, we literally rode around the Capitol, Montgomery. That odometer, when we parked it there, I, I took pictures of this, was on 444.4. I promise, I promise, it, you know, what? And it was not just, okay, wow, I saw 444 or four. It was, we, we saw it coming and it actually happened. It was about the four horsemen. Okay, um, we took off on Sundays. We didn't ride on Sundays. We had different riders driving the truck for us um, on the, uh, Sixth day of the ride, which was the 25th, I rode into Birmingham. Um, now, since we were right, you, you see this state has these 10 circle cities. Those are what has been prophetically called, I believe, freedom outposts or apostolic centers. In the future, these 10 cities will have a certain shieldedness, importance in the spirit, I believe. It wasn't my dream, but it was one of my daughters had a vision that confirmed this before the guy announced it. Anyway, since I was riding from here to here, we weren't really going to, uh, through Anniston uh, or, or through Opelika. So when I got to Birmingham, uh, I had some prophetic people over here near Anniston, and I went over there on the 25th. and. Um, on the 26th, actually, he went over there to Anniston and rode and got up uh, in the Anniston area to cover that spiritually. That's the way we, that's the way we believe. And went up to Chiaha, which mountain is near there, which is the highest mountain in the state. We were on top of the mountain there on the 27th. We, went, I think we took two days to do this. We rode, we rode in the, uh, the route of the Freedom Riders. There's a point there we rode by where the Freedom Riders bus was burned way back when, what, 61, 62. We were there for that. This was about coming against that whole spirit. Um, but on the 27th, we were actually on top of Chiaha, looking down on the state, praying, crying out to God. We were, it's, the, it's the highest point in the state, and it was weird. We could look on top of that mountain. We could look down and see the buzzards. There were buzzards flying this death thing, but they were below us. Uh, anyway, uh, so the torn, uh, that was on the 27th, the day of the tornadoes. 
10 years ago tomorrow. On the uh, next day, uh, after, after the tornadoes, you know, I wanted to cover this Auburn Opelika area. By the way, for all you Auburn fans, Auburn Opelika is in one of the holy cities and Tuscaloosa is not. <laughs> <laughs> but roll tight anyway. Anyway, uh, so we, we, I trailered I trailered the horse over there to Auburn Opelika because I felt like the Lord wanted us to go there and ride it in that town just to put our feet on the ground. Our it, it was it, these these prayers are not just words; prayers are actions. So we went over there, me and uh, a gentleman in the A team and his young daughter who was like twenty years old, and they, they prayed with me and went over there. It was a pretty awesome thing because we're going over there while people are literally being dug out of the rubble and carried to the funeral homes by the hundreds across the state. And we, we rode over there and we actually could see t tracks of tornadoes where they had gone through the day before, you know, through the woods. It was an awesome thing. But the Lord had told me, do not go home. Like the, 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 the warriors for David were assigned to never go home after the battle starts, not until victory. That's the reason Uriah would not go into his wife during the war, okay? So uh, I know that the, the Lord was telling us not to go home. And so my a guy, a good friend in Tennessee brought a huge generator and a whole bunch of gasoline. And it wasn't even available in Alabama. I brought those down to my ranch, which has electric fence and, and a lot of freezers full of beef. Took care of the girls. Took care of my wife. Took care of the ranch. It was all taken care of. I didn't have to worry a bit just keep riding but anyway i went over to opelika it was neat i just going to go over and ride around the town and I, I ride up to first baptist church and this lady comes running out of the church when she sees me and she's wearing i think overalls and a big straw hat and a bandana on and it looks kind of odd coming out of first baptist you can imagine and she says i can't believe you're here i can't believe you're here Hold on, stay right there, stay right there. And it had it was cowboy day for for the the they had a child care thing there for the little kids. I'm talking about three year olds, four year olds, five year olds, and they were all dressed in their little cowboy outfits. And all the workers for the care, the child care thing, were all dressed out in cowboy stuff. And here we lay look up, and here comes a guy, hat and horse, you know, riding up. And, and they just, you know, just couldn't, but, and so I, I, I had, I wound up giving a whole bunch of rides to little boys and girls. I mean, this big, I mean, they were sitting in the saddle, you know, and they were just so cute and they're right. And of course they thought that this was planned and maybe they're right. You know what I mean? Maybe, or if they even think, if little ones even think that far ahead, but there it was. And all these people are dead across the state. And that always amazes me about God. He can do sweet little things like that at the same time there's mourning going on everywhere. These little kids are being treated with a special deal and yet this other thing is going on in the middle of a war. How, that, that baffles me and, and boggles my mind. But he has to do that kind of thing and to be God. I mean, he's got to be laughing and crying all at the same time. So anyway, just wanted to let you know that happened. I'm coming to the end here. Um, so then on the 30th, I was back in, see, I had a place to stay here in Birmingham at the same place where the Transformers went off. I spend the night there, you know, I go back, spend the night there getting ready to ride the last leg down to Montgomery. But before we rode the last, last leg to Montgomery, the other three legs came to Birmingham to ride around the city of Birmingham. We rode around the city of Birmingham with all those skyscrapers and all that stuff. It was, a, you talk about some spooky horses. I mean, it was thick, but the Lord, it was a really anointed time. It was April the 30th. It was a Saturday, 2011. By the way, as I rode into Birmingham, when I was getting to Birmingham three or four days before, I came to I, I 2059. It's a, it's an interstate there in town and it's an overpass. And it's loud, you know, the traffic's going boom, 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 And my horse would not go under that thing. I mean, so I backed her up 
I turned her around. I, and I can make her go backwards any places I can't make her go forwards. There's some places she just balk. You can beat her all you want to. I had my spurs. I had my whip. But that wasn't doing it. So I turned around and I backed her up <laughs> under that overpass. You know, I don't know, it was 50 yards or something. So I, I figured I was backing up from 59 to 20. Okay, yeah, right. Anyway, uh, so I backed her, backed her under there. It was, you know, it was the adventure of a lifetime. God was asking me to, you know, I'd rather do that than have any vacation to the mountains, any vacation to the ocean. I can't think of anything. But the fact that you're doing it for the Lord and you know you're doing it for the Lord. You know what I mean? You know, it doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter how much time it takes. The Lord's asking you to do it. And guess what? What a reward. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And he is rejuvenating. He just healed my knees. A year ago, I was an invalid. Here I am riding across the country. Uh, you know, you're going, when you're out in the open country, you go by somebody's house and little kids come running out. And you get out, get off, and give them a ride. Down below Birmingham, there was two little black twins that came out. They were about this big, just squealing, just squealing. And their mama was right behind them, and behind her was this other white lady, and then this black lady, and these two kids, they were out front. And one of them's name was Miles, and the other one's name was Monroe. That's my grandpa's name. You know what I mean? And they were these twins. And I gave these, these little guys a ride out there in the country, somewhere between Birmingham and Montgomery on on highway 31 it was fun it was so fun and you were you know people would say because people remember the palomino and they remember roy rogers hey look i saw roy rogers i saw roy Rogers. well that's whatever little boy wants you know so anyway it was more fun than, than ever but it was it was so the lord but in closing on april the 30th saturday see we didn't ride on sundays because one thing we needed the rest and the horse needed some rest we spent the night there on, on April the 30th, and I was having a hard, I couldn't get any of the, the group to agree to ride, drive for me. And I could not go any further without, a, I didn't have a truck and trailer, because when you got done, you got to put the horse somewhere. And that's where all your feed is and your shelter and all that kind of stuff. But nobody would, would agree to, to drive for me. But I got a hold of this guy up in Huntsville. Now, again, I'm spending at this warehouse there in Birmingham. My at night, I would, I had these panels on my, six, I have a 16 foot trailer and it's in two sections and the front section was where the feed and hay and all was and the horse could be in the back section. But when I had the opportunity, I'd take these panels off and make a little fence around the back of the trailer so that Daisy could be off the trailer. And so she was getting some rest. But anyway, nobody would agree to, to drive for me. And then I called this guy all, all the way up. God bless him. The guy that, that zeroed my odometer later on. They was all the way up in Huntsville. And he agreed to come down to, to Birmingham for these three days and drive for me. And then another guy volunteered. And so I had actually had two drivers and two escorts. And we were the three amigos. And we headed south. And by the, by the way, we came to a... We call ourselves the Three Amigos, but we came to this Mexican restaurant, and the name of it was uh, Three Amigos, and we posed in front of it, and we were having fun. And we were like boys and stuff, and riding, riding, riding. But <clears throat> before that guy, after that guy volunteered, said he would come down and drive for me. This is on the night of the 30th, April 30th. I had a dream or trance or whatever you call it, sleeping there in the warehouse in a little bedroom. And I saw in a, the dream or trance, whatever you call it, the Lord was standing by my bed on the left side. I couldn't even come close to seeing a face. I could, just, it was just a form there. And he said to me, Colossians 4.17. Colossians 4.17. And I promise you, I did not know what Colossians 4.17 said. But you can believe that I, I, mean, I, I looked. As, you know, as soon as I, I heard that, I woke up, got my Bible, and this is what Colossians 4.17 says. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the work you have received in the Lord. Well, you know, look, y'all, I am really not a, a real good horseman. I'm a very enthusiastic horseman. I love to ride. It's like being a Superman when you got a good horse under you and you can just... 
but I am not really that artistic or gifted, but Archippus means the master of the horse. And so if the Lord said to me, hey, master of the horse, see to it that you complete the work you've been given in the Lord. Yeah, yeah, okay, I got this. I will do this, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, spare no expense. Yes, I got that from Jesus Christ, not, not even knowing what the, the passage said. So anyway, we headed south and took three more days to get down there. Uh, uh, we wrote March, May, May 2nd, 3rd, and 4th was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then on 5-5 was Thursday, and that's when we, went, we rode around the Capitol. A couple of more things. We rode those three days. As we got to the last day, and we had to cross the Alabama River, this big bridge there. As I approached the bridge for the first time, and y'all, you can trust me, I've been outside. I knew what the outside sounded like. But I'd spent all these times outside for, you know, these two and a half weeks. The, the July flies started. They started singing. You know, how, the first time you hear the July flies, every year it's like i don't know it's like something special because you hear it every year but you don't miss it and don't remember it until it starts they start doing that again it started as i approached the bridge but believe it or not when i got across that bridge into montgomery county montgomery city there with my horse when we hit the ground on the other side the 13 year locust started singing and i didn't know what they were i sat down i got off my horse sat down on the ground held the reins and just listened, and I got out my phone and tried to record it. I don't have that same phone anymore, but I thought it was angels. I, it's a different sound than July flies. I thought it was angels. I didn't know what it was, but as far as I was concerned, it was angels, and it was it was just hair raising. It was, and it happened as soon as I put my foot in Montgomery County. And so anyway, the next day again, I had been carrying four. So I, just before the ride over here at the local uh, hardware store, the guy had had four silver dollars for sale. And I had bought all four of those, knowing it was, they were pretty cheap back then, and just put them in my pocket, and I kept them in my pocket, all four of them. And when we got to, the, to that parking lot in Montgomery, I gave the uh, three of the four to the other leaders of the other legs to kind of bring in a spiritual unity and we got on our horses there and my odometer was on 444.4 and we rode in a circle, National Day of Prayer, 5511. There were people praying and worshiping on the steps of the Capitol. And, and again, there was a lot of repentance going on for racism, but we rode around, you know, that area there. It was, uh, I forget the name of the Baptist church where Dr. King pastored and all those famous things happened there. Um, but we rode around that, and y'all, I promise, the whole time we rode around that that place, there was a sun dog. We got pictures of it. And the biggest sun dog I've ever seen in my life, straight up above our head, this shaft of rainbow, just like I had seen in the first of the two dreams. Y'all, okay, so why does God let bad stuff happen? I, you know, there's just a whole lot going on. It's got to do with free will. It's got to do with the demonic. It's got to do with angels. It's got to do with people. I don't understand it all. I do know it's a reality. I just want to do what he tells me. I'm a man under authority. And I will do whatever he tells me. That happened. Now, I can say this to you. Uh, when that happened with the tornadoes, in closing, when that happened with the tornadoes, record breaker, 66 tornadoes, one day, 280 dead, but nobody dead in Coleman. But Coleman flattened. As a matter of fact, I was at bed and breakfast just below there where the power was on. The power was off all the way across the state for about six days, just like Betty had said. But where I was, it was on, and I saw a lot of feed of that tornado coming across Coleman. But nobody died. Uh, and they said, over there, it looks like a nuclear bomb went off, just like in my dream. And they said that this is the new normal, global warming. So from now on, you expect this kind of storms every year. My wife, 
not calling her name or anything. But my wife, a few years later, four or five years later, I, I, I got this saved somewhere. I'm not very good at keeping up with stuff, but found an article by the NOAA Weather Service that said, we thought that after April 27th, 2011, that there would be a, in, you know, the tornadoes would be increasing. But in fact, in the Southeast, there has been a tornado drought in particular. Statistically, it has dropped radically and the number of tornadoes over F1-2 has dropped the most and specifically the number of deaths in the state has dropped radically. This is not what we expected, but here's the stats. Now, I don't have that printed out. I wish I had that printed out. But that happened. Now, were lives saved because we did what we did? I, I believe so. I believe so with all my heart. Did it cost lives to take on the battle? Yes, but that's war. You know, they thought that, that General Patton, you know, was blood and guts Patton, that he was, you know, causing too much death, but actually looking back on it, actually looking back on it, he saved lives. He saved lives by being aggressive. Generally speaking, that's what you need to do in war. Don't hesitate, go forward. But without any doubt, without any apology, the Lord told us to do that. We did that. And I believe it's got a lot to do with a lot more than just weather in Alabama, just death in Alabama. The Lord is building on that. Um, he's always going further up, further in. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for this, listen for this lengthy message. Father, in Jesus' name, please breathe on the chaos one more time and bless this teaching in Jesus' name. I pray, amen.